Um, basically, where do we begin my story? Um, I'm a uh, staff reporter with the National Catholic Register. Uh, they're Washington correspondent. I've been with the Register since about uh, July of 2013. And basically what, what I do is I'm a storyteller. And I'm, I have a passion for connecting people with the information or the stories that I see that I think they should know so that people can make judgments about the world in which they live. Um, so that they can make decisions for their families, for their communities, and for their country, uh, and for the world at large, from a Catholic perspective. Uh, it's a very unique, it's a very unique vocation that Catholic journalists have, and it's especially important in this world because we bring a very unique perspective. Um, we bring the perspective of people who are trying to see the world through the eyes of the Catholic Church and to try to engage not only our fellow Catholics, uh, but other people uh, through our stories so that they can come to make those good judgments uh, about the world. The unique thing about being a newsman is that, uh, is that all you're doing is telling people the story. You don't have to take a side, this side or that side. All you're trying to do is not convince people of a certain point of view, but it's just to tell people about the world and offer different perspectives so that they can make up their own mind. They can make up their own judgments. Uh, that's why I'm just an old school journalist. I think this approach has a lot more to offer than uh, other approaches such as advocacy journalism, uh, where you are taking a particular point of view and trying to push that. I don't think that's necessary, uh, especially for the Catholic journalist. Uh, there is a world here, and we're here to tell a story, and that's compelling. Uh, so, uh, I came to Christendom uh, in 2004 because I was very much attracted by what this college offered. Uh, when I was uh, a young man flipping through uh, my uh, political magazines or things like First Things, uh, I saw a college that advertised itself as a place that valued excellence and wanted people to go out and restore all things in Christ. And to me, that was a very attractive mission. Uh, at the time, uh, at the time when I came here, uh, I had an idea that I would be a classics major um, and uh, potentially uh, a lawyer, uh, some kind of advocate of that kind. Uh, at one point, I entertained a military career so the, the world had uh, open horizons. What, a couple things happened along the way, though. Well, when I was here, a bunch of us saw uh, a need to make Christendom a place where Catholic journalists could be formed from our education, which provided us such a wealth of resources, uh, but also but also a place where we needed practical experience. So that's one of the reasons that we started the campus newspaper called The Rambler. The idea being we were gonna form Catholic journalists. And so I was a co-founder of that with John Josephit. Um, it had, Rambler had existed previously as an opinion journal, so we turned it into a news journal. And this was very valuable because it gave us as I started to get into the process, I realized this is something that I loved. I loved connecting the students with what was going on in the outside world. I loved, uh, Sam Phillips' uh, father gave him uh, packets of news clippings and information. And, uh, and Sam and I's friendship, uh, he would pass them along to me, and I would synthesize them and repeat them back to him uh, so that he could tell his dad what, what he had read. <laughs> Um, but it was, it was a great thing because it actually turned me on to this vocation of being a storyteller because that's what I was doing. I was taking that and I was putting it into articles for the Rambler. So I, I have a lot to credit to Sam and his dad for putting me on this path. 
So uh, I took a year off, which is why I graduated with the class of 2009. When I came back in my junior year, uh, I took over as editor-in-chief of Rambler. Uh, at the same time, I started to get my feet wet in journalism through uh, working for uh, LifeSite News. And I was uh, a part-time staff reporter uh, with them for a while. When I graduated, I was on with them full time uh, until about uh, 2011, when I, I came to realization that while I gained valuable experience, I wanted more in my career. I, I wanted to talk about things from um, an angle that wasn't simply pro-life, but more encompassing. And I didn't know what that was yet. So what I did was I took a, an internship, which proved very valuable, uh, with the National Journalism Center in uh, August of 2011. So I left my job at LifeSite to take on this internship, because I thought secondary news is something I wanted to do. And the National Journalism Center is a fantastic experience, because what they do is they provide you with a thousand dollar a month stipend. So you can go and work in a news outlet in Washington, D.C. and gain very practical experience in the field. So you're generating news clips, you're getting experience, you're uh, being trained once a week. The idea was you work with your the designated news outlet you're with for four days and then what you do is you go with them and you uh, on a Friday, you do a in-house training seminar, and that was a fantastic experience. I had a, a great editor uh, by the name of Billy McMorris, who is now at the Washington Free Beacon, uh, who gave me marvelous training, uh, also fantastic anecdotes. Uh, my first job interview was a drinking contest with my boss. Uh, but that's the great thing about a journalist. You, you get to do, you have, you meet very interesting people and you have very fun experiences because people are interesting. Each one of you here has a story. Each one of you has a story, a background, something that makes you unique and makes you tick. And the great thing about a journalist is I can go up to you and ask you very deep, personal, probing questions. And You'll tell me them, because there's something in us that wants to tell our story. Because we're human beings, we're relational beings. So I'm going to get into my Christian education and why that was important. Because the Catholic liberal arts education that you get here at Christendom is extraordinarily high caliber. I mean, my, my father had gone to Princeton and basically said, the liberal arts education you're getting is far surpasses what I got in the 1970s. And, you know, you can start, you, there's a temptation to devalue that because you're at a small college. But really, you stand on the shoulders of giants here because people have sacrificed to make this education the very, very best. And they're constantly improving that. The beauty of the Catholic liberal arts education is that not only do you look at the world from a Catholic perspective, which is very, very rich and has a diverse number of points to look from, but a liberal arts education trains you to look at things from a variety of angles. Right now, how much of the room can you see? Just venture, anybody venture a guess. If you were going to look at the room from where you're sitting right now, what would it be? Speak up. Somebody. You. How much of the room can you see? Really? Can you see behind these chairs what they look like? Can you see what's behind your head? What's behind the bar? Things like that. Your first answer, your first instinct is to say, yes, I see most of it. But if you take a look from here, from over there, and from over there, you have a far richer perspective of what the room actually looks like than if you're sitting over there. That's what you do with liberal arts education. You don't really think about it because it becomes second nature to you. When you're a journalist, this is a very valuable skill that you really need. Because if you're going to tell people about the world, you have to step outside of yourself and try to look at it from various different angles. So 
so you can give people the fullest picture. One of the, a great professor of mine, uh, Dr. Steven Snyder, uh, he had this, uh, we did a recent philosophy class. And the, he left me with a very valuable lesson that I really cherish to this day, which was, you can take somebody like Jean-Paul Sartre, and he's wrong about many different things, but it's very rarely that you come across a person who is 100% wrong. He says one thing that Sartre valued was consistency, because he saw that there's something wrong if you say you hold a principle, but you apply it inconsistently through your life. Now, he was consistently bad, or at least tried to be, but think about that for a second. You can start to realize that maybe the other person who has a totally different view on this, maybe they actually do see something that I don't. Maybe they see something that is a good, but maybe the means that they're looking for are wrong. Like things like the, the church says, we need to have some kind of universal health care. Well, some people will say, well, you're talking about socialism. Catholic journalist, when he thinks about it, and looks at it, and says, not really. That's not what the church talks about. It doesn't mean universal health care, meaning we need a central government in order to do this. What we need to do is we need to engage society from the highest to the lowest working together so that everyone's health can be taken care of. This is the same thing with the church's defense of human life. It's not just the unborn, but it's everybody's human dignity, whether they're uh, a prisoner, whether they're suspected of committing a crime, whether they were at the end of life, whether they are in poverty. The treatment of a person goes to what their human dignity is, as made in the image of God. So that's when you, you can sit, say, this person has a good idea. There's something there. But I can step outside of that and look at what they have right and what they have wrong. You can get a lot of peace out of it. Um, I was also um, with uh, Sam Phillips, a co-founder of the Chester Ballot Debate Society. And that was a very valuable experience for me because arguing things out with people who are actually your friends and you discover you're on opposite points of view, you can learn to engage them in a way in which you're going after the idea, but you keep your respect for the other person. You value the other person as somebody who has something valuable to say. Even if you disagree with it, they have something valuable to say. But this experience, this practical experience, allows you to practice valuing that person for what they have to say, even when you disagree with them and say, but I think that it's wrong. And I think this is how we're right. The Catholic liberal arts education also opens you to being corrected by others, because I can see that I think I see the world in a certain way, but on the other hand, I'm not infallible. And I can be open to correction. I'll give you another example. Um, I once took a very, uh, probably what I would call probably very conservative position on immigration um, before I started working as a Catholic journalist. Um, it was only when I started working on the story, I thought to myself, you know, I take a certain point of view, there are these people coming over the border and they're breaking our laws and they're illegals and blah, 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 blah. Um, that was my sincerely held point of view. But I thought to myself, but as I'm doing this story, I'm going to try to invite what the other points of view in the church are, and hear what the bishops are saying. Bring that into my story. So I'm not only bringing the, the point of view in, which is legitimate, that there are people coming across the border who are breaking laws, and there are certain um, problems with the common good that are there. But I'm also bringing the church's perspective that 
No, there's a fundamental human dignity that the persons have. Don't look at them as somebody who just came over the border. Look at their story. What is happening? What's going on in their home countries? In which I discovered a number of things. One of which is that Central America has been destabilized ever since the United States got involved in the Civil Wars in the 80s. What happened was that unlike what happened with Europe after 1945, when it was in chaos, the United States came in and had the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, which was very successful. We did not do the same thing with Central America. In the 90s, we started deporting uh, illegal immigrants who had come up with were basically refugees from those wars. And we started deporting them back, people who had been involved in gangs. And there was a social, there was a brokenness and a void in those societies because of all the families that had been killed, all the fathers and mothers that were uh, beheaded and tortured uh, in the fights between right-wing and left-wing organizations. And what you had was a, so all of a sudden this gang element out of Los Angeles come in and start to overwhelm these countries. And which brings us to, to today when there was that recent wave of 90,000 kids that came over the border. Why would parents do this? Well, when you start to look at the key Central American countries involved, their murder rates are astronomical. They're the highest in the world. Places where a person is eating a cheeseburger and gets his head blown off in a restaurant. Are these things that you would think about normally every day in our political discourse? No. When you take a Catholic point of view and start to delve into the story and look at human dignity with the eyes of the church, you start to gain a far richer perspective. A perspective in which I think if people knew about it, they'd say, well, maybe there are proactive things we can do so people don't have to leave their homes, so people can stay in safety where they grew up. I personally never wanted to live in Virginia. It's a beautiful state, wonderful people, but I'm from upstate New York. I love it. It's beautiful, lake country. It's the, the home of my heart. But the problem is, there's no jobs up there. There's no jobs, there's no economic opportunity. And so you have all these Yankees like me coming down south to Washington, D.C. and elsewhere to go where the jobs are. Well, the jobs were there in upstate New York if they had fostered opportunity and, and uh, reduced taxes so that families could thrive. I probably would have moved back up there, taken a, a job, maybe in some enterprise in the journalism field, who knows. You start to realize a person naturally, what do they really want to do at the end of the day? So, I'm only offering to you that, that example. I'm not saying that you should adopt my opinion or point of view. I'm just telling you some things that I learned. And looking through the eyes of the church, they did change how I viewed, uh, viewed the situation. To the point which I wonder to myself, well, if you really, really want to fix it, illegal immigration, just tell all the employers of illegal immigrants that they, uh, unauthorized immigrants, I should say. There's a fight about the language there. Uh, but that they should uh, pay for everybody's repatriation. <coughs> a good deal. Um, Anyway, that's only my own perspective. Um, so, so it's uh, always important to question assumptions. You may find friends on your side, people in the pro-life movement, uh, other Catholic movements, and you have to ask fundamental questions. Um, Catholic Relief Services is a great place in point. At one point, Catholic Relief Services did not have its act together on certain church teachings certain flaws in the structure of the organization. And there were some news organizations that rightly pointed out there are things that are wrong. But uh, sometimes people that you think that you would ordinarily trust to get it right get it wrong, which is why as a Catholic journalist you always have to ask questions. The uh, an old phrase in journalism, does your mother love you? You gotta answer that question, yes, you're not being a good journalist. You gotta check it out. Um, and that's the same thing here. Catholic Relief Services was accused of providing mortification contraceptives in Madagascar. Um, and I looked into that, um, doing some uh, exhaustive 
doing some exhaustive research and interviews, uh, and I found out that was not the case. Um, so there's a sense of justice there. You are there to tell a story, and you're there to do justice to the story. Because I don't care what your point of view is, people deserve the truth. We're not here to sell our points of view, we're here to tell people the truth, because we as Catholics believe the truth will set you free. Um, so if they do bad things, I will report on it. If they do good things, I will report on it. If they are falsely accused of doing bad things, I will set the record straight. That is the mentality. Um, so anyway, uh, all right. Uh, I suppose at one point you can ask me questions, but I don't want to ramble on and on and on, um, which I have been doing for years. Um, but I actually want to give you something practical, because uh, this is the last per personal anecdote. Uh, I was unemployed for a year. Um, this is where I probably have to finish up my story. Uh, after my stint with National Journalism Center, I had an internship, great experience for uh, four months working with Virginia State House News and their old uh, Dominion Watchdog investigative unit. And I was very highly recommended by my editor for some strange reason, strange workings of Providence, no jobs opened up. Uh, when you're coming off an internship and you're in your mid-twenties, this is not a good thing. Uh, I had the good fortune to be able to stay in the area because I, uh, a friend of mine, Captain Joseph Mazera, connected me with a friend of his who needed military case studies. And uh, I did that until about June of 2000, um, about 2012. After that, uh, my completely dried up. I had to leave Virginia and go home. I had absolutely nothing. And there's no more horrible feeling, I think, than being deprived of the dignity of work and realizing that at about 25, your life is going nowhere, on hold. Um, because opportunity dried up and you don't know how to get it. Uh, it was, uh, thanks to my uncle that he put me in touch with uh, uh, a great Catholic um, newsman by the name of Bob DeWitt in Pittsburgh. And Bob taught me basically how to figure out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do. Because when I was unemployed, I, I had just a crisis. I was, I was uh, burned out from journalism. I had worked 16-hour days when I was finishing up my stint. Um, and uh, my editor was under political pressures at his organization, and it was, uh, I was burnt out. I didn't think I wanted to do it again. Bob helped me understand, helped me work through a process in which I decided that, well, what I wanted to do was capital communications. And it took several months to get to that point, but I had a valuable resource, which I would recommend all of you get, which is, uh, what color is your parachute? Get the latest edition and work through that book. It will help you understand what's your core assets, what, what key skills you have, what your interests are. And it's all, as we know, Socrates said, know thyself. I'm paraphrasing Socrates, but it's, it's that point. All of you have a vocation. God has given you something great to do. That is why you are here at this college. If you do not believe that you are, have nothing great to do, and that God is not calling you here, you're probably miserable. Or if not, you're probably in some kind of crisis that you haven't worked through. But if you're here, rest assured, God has called you to do something great with your life. He has given you an education that calls you to greatness. You must seize it. And take all the tools and the opportunities that you can to do so. So let me give you some practical advice. Get that book, What Colors Your Parachute, and start working through it. Get groups of you together and start working through it. Support each other. Um, the second thing also is you guys have to network. When I came in, um, you all are 
basically children of the post-recession era. When I came in, the understanding was you get a degree and a degree opens doors. That doesn't work anymore. You get a degree, so does everybody else. Uh, there's a PhD working at Starbucks. The key today is you get a degree, you have these valuable tools with the Christian education. Now you have to find the doors that will unlock opportunity for you. 30% of the jobs are advertised. And there are 3 million people applying for the same job. You don't want to be among those people. What you want to be looking for is the 70% of jobs that are not advertised because they are known by people working in the field who would rather recommend them to people they trust so they don't have to go through this experience of wading through a stack full of resumes to, try to take a risk on somebody at the end of the day. Networking is key. I'm going to give you, unfortunately, this is rather, uh, this is rather very small and fine print. And this is from an old uh, networking planner that I had on my Gmail drive. Uh, and just um, print it off for you. It's not up to date at all, but you can kind of see what I was doing. What you want to do is you want to find people in, once you go through the parachute book and know what you want or what you want to pursue, you want to, set, you want to get informational meetings. The beauty of an informational meeting is like a first date. It's totally non-committal. You're not in a steady relationship. You're just finding out about the other person. And you may decide that you want to run away screaming, but that's okay. They may too. But you realize, you realize something. You realize something more about yourself. You realize something more about the field that you're looking at. You want to go in with an informational, you want to go in for an informational meeting that is 15 minutes. You never want to go over 15 minutes. You ask for it, you tell them, hey, can I meet with you for 15 minutes? I'd like to learn more about your career and your field. And, uh, if you could have any advice for somebody that's interested in that. They may have a job for you. They may not. But the thing is, you stay in touch with them. Jobs, they'll hear about jobs. And if you stay in touch frequently enough, I would say about two to three months, you will be in their minds so that they can say, oh, Bob, you're looking for somebody in that position. I actually know somebody that I think might be a fit. Um, why don't you, why don't I put them in touch with you? That's ultimately how I got employed at the register. Um, uh, I started Bob putting in touch with two people um, to network with. One was Mike Ackley, the cat father, and um, uh, oh, I forget his name, but it's uh, Greg over at um, Our Sunny Blizzard, Greg Erlin, Erlinson. And I talked, with, I talked with those people, and they gave me several other names. Eventually, I was put in touch with David Scott at the Archdiocese in Los Angeles. He then put me in touch with Jeanette DeMello, my editor, who said, I need somebody to write a story on this. I ended up losing here. I was like, I'm not sure I want to do this. But on the other hand, you know, I need 250 bucks. So uh, I did. I realized I loved it. This is cool. This is journalism like I've never done it before. It was exciting. They were impressed. They saw my work. They gave me more. I started doing freelancing for um, our Sunday visitor as well. They gave me more. And eventually, it was uh, eventually uh, the editor Jeanette Demello said, "Hey, I'd love to meet you. love to meet with you in person, talk with you about hiring you on full time." at the National Catholic Register. And I was hired in July of 2013, uh, just about uh, a year, less than a year since I started actively job hunting through networking. So uh, the key strategy is if you talk, when you talk to a person, come with questions, do some research on them. Come with questions, always come up with questions because it shows that you are interested and you're engaged and you want to show that you're like-minded. So it's never a bad thing to slightly overdress. You want to try to hit it on top of it, but don't underdress. 
if they are talking to you and they lean forward to you like this, you lean it forward. If they start leaning back as they're talking, you lean back. The body language says we're operating in the same way. Yeah, you and me, we're really the same person. Isn't that cool? So they think this person is like me, this is somebody I can trust enough to recommend my good name to talk to these other people or to recommend you for this job. So I started out with, so I started with this, this list and I put down the contact date so I can keep in track of how many times I contacted them. Their name, what the company or organization they worked with. The location, because I was thinking about three different areas. One was DC, the other was Rochester, Buffalo, Pittsburgh. Um, I noted who they refer, who, who referred me to them. Uh, put down what the meeting date was, when I was supposed to, when I first met them, when I was supposed to meet them, when I was supposed to meet them next. Um, I put down who they referred me to, so I could keep track of the relationships. Um, I put down notes about them. You know, what did we discuss in the meeting? What does he like? You know, if he likes the Boston Patriots. I hate the Patriots. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. But you know, if he likes the Patriots, I ask, hey, what'd you think about that game? Crazy catch, wasn't it? Crazy call. Um, you're building relationships with people. Networking is about relationships. And you're not building relationships for just, can this person get me a job? But build relations with this person because they will put you in touch with people who will eventually get you that job. Or it will come their way and you will get that job. Um, uh, send them a thank you note after the meeting. As soon as you get back, write them a thank you note and put it in the mail. Because this shows thoughtfulness on your part, that you are taking initiative, you go and get things done. Um, um, you know, ask them, uh, when you go to an informational meeting, always bring your resume on file. Uh, don't bring it up unless they ask for it, but have it on there, because generally they will. Um, and uh, yeah, after the meeting, Connect with them on LinkedIn. You should all have a LinkedIn account. Um, you're not going to necessarily get a job through LinkedIn, but it's good to have a presence so you can keep track of people and so they can keep track of you and uh, remember you. And um, uh, sometimes when you're working on things, send them to them. Say, hey, uh, I was working on this, did this article, Wanted to know if you could give me some constructive criticism. Build relationships with these people. Keep in touch with them. You will not have to suffer. I guarantee you it is suffering of graduating and realizing the clock is ticking down when you have to pay off an enormous amount of debt and you have nothing other than maybe a $7 an hour job, if that. Um, this is your future, seize the day. Um, so, and uh, one thing I would also recommend is have an elevator pitch, have an elevator speech, basically just introducing yourself. You know, I'm Peter Jesser Smith, I'm somebody who's passionate about telling stories and connecting people with information that matters in their everyday life. You know, I, working at uh, the National Catholic Register since July of 2013, where I, you know, done hard-hitting stories. At the National Journalism Center, that's where I gained the tools to dig deep and look into the facts. And it was my Christian college education that gave me the tools to take a broad perspective of the world and really see what's going on. And what I really want is an organization, an institution, that's going to value my desire for excellence and my desire to contribute that excellence uh, to the world. Now, off the cuff, I just gave you an elevator speech. That's, that's where the conversation starts. And then you say, so can you tell me about your story? 
How did you get involved in Christian College or where, wherever you are? That's what you need to do. And I hope every one of you, I hope if anything, my life story, Christian College, this is extraordinarily valuable. But these practical tools, please remember them, internalize them, and seize the day. Um, and uh, that would have been a great closer, but um, last thing of all is get business cards. Get business cards, because when you're doing networking meetings, you want to be able to give this to them. Something professional, um, you know, have a professional email address. Um, I'm sure Greg is probably teaching all this, but I wish I had more cards. I would have given them to you all, but if you uh, do want it and you want to stay in touch with me uh, and you would like maybe a better copy of this, um, it's uh, right here. Actually, I'll leave it with Greg. Let's go up to him. But that'll show what you want to do with it. All right, thank you, Peter. There's plenty of chairs here in the front, so if you guys are staying and would like to grab a chair or you'd like to grab a drink, some more food, feel free to do so. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, um, if you do want to put together business cards, go to Vistaprint, vistaprint.com. You get free business cards. I think you can pay shipping and handling, but uh, that's where I made my first ones, even though now I've got like, fancy Christmas ones. Um, the second thing is What Colors Your Parachute it is a really good book, as Peter was saying. I do have copies in the office, so feel free to come over and check those out. He comes out, the guy um, updates the book every year, so uh, each edition is a little bit different than that previous generation. So now while you guys are grabbing drinks, getting yourself situated, if you guys want to move chairs around, feel free to do so. But it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Charlie Sperry. He's a White House correspondent for Breitbart News. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about his uh, background and then give you some tips uh, some as well. So, Charlie? Thanks for uh, having me. Um, Peter, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Billy Morris. Uh, he also, I also know him as a Catholic journalist, and uh, we, he's a great guy, brings a lot of fear. Um, he's also a Catholic, he has two kids, and we frequently drink and talk about what it's like to be a dad and to be a journalist at the same time. And uh, it's really quite a unique situation that we both have. I, uh, I really appreciate it. And, uh, but Peter's absolutely right. I didn't know he went through the National Journalism Center, but that is the one thing you can do right now. Right? You can write it down, Google it, research it. They offer internships um, all year round. Um, and if you have, you know, sometimes people have to go home and work in the summer and make money, but if you have a spare summer and you're really interested in journalism, you can get into that program. It's fabulous. I mean, they now give you $1,000 a month a year, you say, which is way more than they ever gave me. I, I had to work through Starbucks to get myself through, so. Um, but yeah, it's a really unique opportunity because that organization opened a lot of doors into people within the journalism world. Um, and through them, you can start to build a network of people in that world.